Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. It is also the Sunday where we celebrate um, our commitment to the life of this church. And we do that through our tithes and our offerings. And so today I want to encourage you to give, as Corinthians tells us, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, for those of you who may be worshiping online, we remind you that you can give online through a secure company, and you just need to go to the church's website, click on the donations link, um, and you can go directly to set up those payments online. Pledge cards today will be collected during the offering. If you did not get one and you would like to participate in the pledging, um, I encourage you to raise your hand and briefly, um, I'm looking for John. John, do you have the cards? Yes, perfect. Um, John will have cards and if you just indicate, he will be glad to uh, provide you with one of those this morning. Um, the life of the church, um, you know, we're reminded is um, not all about money. It's about relationships. But the only way that we can continue to build relationships and to reach out to others who are in need, others who need to know Christ, others who need a helping hand, is through our gifts of tithes and offerings, um, as well as your many gifts of talents and time. So I encourage you uh, this week uh, to do that um, with joy in your heart knowing that you are making a difference. As we prepare for the closing out of the month of November, it's hard to imagine that we are to that point, but we are eagerly preparing for Advent. And so Advent is going to begin on Sunday, December the 1st at 9 a.m. out in the Commons area. We're having an Advent workshop loosely known as Sunday School on Steroids. Um, and so I encourage you to come and be part of that. It is intergenerational. Everybody will be meeting together. We will be uh, beginning our journey to Bethlehem. And there is a sign up in the commons area because we're going to have a light repast for breakfast that morning. Um, coffee and all of the good things. So I encourage you to mark your calendars and to definitely come and be part of that. Are there any other announcements? We're trying to uh, move forward to me giving the announcements, but last Sunday I did miss somebody who was planning to speak. So is there anyone who has announcements they would like to share that I do not have? Seeing none, let us rejoice and be glad, for this is the day that the Lord hath made. Please stand for the call to worship. We gather in abundance, away from the rush and the race, to celebrate the generous spirit that sings, without fear, may all have enough. We gather in grace, awake to the sin of despair and degradation, awake to the chance to be more and the possibilities of living in Christ's grace. We gather to grow, to change moment by moment, in grace again and again. We gather in hope, ready to do more than talk, ready to make change one letter, one meal, one home, one gift, and one hand at a time, ready to live and move and be, ready to be the change God calls us to be. We gather to give of our time and our talents, our hopes and our energy. We gather to be. Please bow for the prayer of the day. Oh God, you are our God and we come as your people on earth. Gather us in, that we may remember the ties that bind us together in your love. Write your law upon our hearts, 
that others may find us to be generous and loving friends. Strengthen us by your spirit that we may live in love, a love that transforms our lives, even as we help to transform the lives of others. In the hope of your miraculous love, we pray, amen.
be seated. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us and our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. In unison together, helper God, be the hope that overcomes our despair. Be the love that overcomes our hatred. Be the mercy that overcomes our sin. Set us free from the prisons of our own making and release us from the bonds that bind us. Forgive us and watch over us. Welcome us home into the loving arms of your mercy. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You are not far from the kingdom of God, for in Christ we are given grace and forgiveness. Praise God for this marvelous gift. As the church, we gather together in the spirit of Ruth and Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Where you dwell, I will dwell. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. We're bound as one body in love of God, neighbor, and self. Let us share this bond of unity in Christ as we exchange signs of peace and love.
if our children would come forward. Good morning again. Yo, Maddie, it's good to see both of you up here on the chancel with me this morning. So, we're going to talk about friendships this morning. Do you guys have a really good friend? Do you have someone who's a really good friend? Yeah. So we're going to look at the screen. Can you guys scoot back up here a little bit? Let's scoot up here so you can see the screen. Okay. So this morning we're going to show some pictures of some famous friends. Um, we might need some help from out there in the congregation. So if they draw a blank, we're going to look to you. You are going to be our link. Um, to make this work. So here's, anybody know who this is? The people from uh, Lion King. Lion King, do you know who it is? Puma and Timon. Does that, but it is the Lion King for sure. Maddie, do you, had you, did you watch that movie, The Lion King? No? Let's see if you know this one. Mickey Mouse and Goofy, look at this one. Look at this one. There's another. Oh yeah, you can see it on that one too, that's right. You're so smart, Maddie. All right, who's this? Mm, this is tough, huh? We need some of the boys. Anybody out there in the, in the congregation know who this is? Buzz, Buzz and Lightyear. Lightyear. That's right. Who are these friends? Shrek and Donkey. <gasps> yeah, Shrek and Donkey. And I, we threw this one in here because the donkey is going to make an appearance for Advent among us, so we need to make friends with the donkeys. All right, who's this? Tigger and Pooh. These are my favorite. I think I told you, you weren't here last week, but I told Maddie, Tigger is my all-time favorite character. So Tigger and Pooh. So those friendships are things that we are very familiar with. So what are some things that make a good friend? If you, if you talk about your friend, nice. they're nice to you, aren't they? How, what else do they do? They might like the same things that you like. You, you have activities that you do with them. What are some other things? What about is a nice friend when somebody says, oh, they've promised to come to your house, but then somebody else comes along and offers them to go someplace else, and they say, oh, we're not going to show up because we, we're going to do this instead. Does that make a nice friend? Yeah, it kind of makes you feel really bad when that happens, doesn't it? Or you throw a birthday party and they say they're going to come and then all of a sudden the day of the birthday party arrives and everybody has an excuse for why they can't come, right? They didn't make any commitment to come. They said they would come, but then they didn't do it. So today in our, our church service, we're going to talk about women who were friends. They were also family. And we're going to talk about Ruth and Naomi, and we talked about them a little bit. So Ruth and Naomi were actually a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. So they're not related by blood, and they have a choice to make about whether they're going to stay together. And Naomi um, decides to stay with Ruth, even though she's not in her own country. Can you imagine being so committed to somebody that they went with you and they stayed with you, and when they had a chance to go home, they didn't take it, but they stayed with you instead? That would that'd be a really good friend, right? So when we hear about them, we know that um, Ruth would not go, and she tells Naomi, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So she was loyal to stay with them no matter what. So here's something about friends. Friends can really do some rotten things sometimes. They're not always faithful. They're, sometimes they let you down, or they find another best friend, or sometimes they don't mean to, but they just move away, right? You know, they just don't have any choice. But the thing that we really want to remember about friendship is that God is a faithful friend. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never finds somebody that he likes better. He loves us, and he is faithful to be with us at all times. And it's important that you have a friend like that so that when you're sad or when you're really happy or you have good news to share or you have questions and you don't know the answers, it's good to have a friend like Jesus that we can go to. So let's pray this morning for, and thank God for his faithful friendship. 
Gracious God, we thank you for being our faithful friend. Help us to remember that you are always with us. Help us to be loyal to you and to share the same, show the same commitment to you that you show for us. We thank you for your love, and we love you in return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may go to your seats as soon as you get something out of the basket. This morning in the children's message, we referred to the passages from this morning and they're woven, the story is woven into the sermon this morning. But today, um, as we have mentioned, um, concludes the formal stewardship campaign here at Forest Presbyterian. It's a Sunday normally known as Commitment Sunday, but commitment is not just a once a year conversation. So while we conclude the official campaign, the question of commitment is one that weighs on our hearts uh, because it is fundamental to how we live and breathe as a church, how we live and breathe as friends and family. So let's talk about some simple examples of why commitment is important. When merging onto a highway, we make the decision to merge into traffic, but sometimes we don't make a commitment, and it's not a very pretty sight. And pretty soon, you can have a whole line of very agitated drivers behind you. Would you just go? Make a commitment, push on the gas pedal, and get out into the lane. This is certainly true, I have learned, when trying to get out of our lane here and onto forest. 
If you do not just say a prayer and hit the gas, you will be there a very, very long time. Indecision can cause a considerable amount of frustration. But there are situations where a lack of commitment can be disastrous and actually have far-reaching implications far beyond simple frustration. I performed a number of weddings. In fact, I performed one yesterday and officiated at the wedding. And on occasion, you know, these occasions, the bride and the groom come together and they make some pretty significant promises to one another. I take you to be my wedded spouse, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. When I officiate those weddings, I am always prayerful that they will be able to endure the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. Yet according to statistics, 50% of all marriages will end in divorce. So you have to ask, why do some prosper and some fall off the rails? I am convinced that the vital ingredient in marriage is commitment. Charles Stanley in his book, Confronting Casual Christianity, says the divorce rate is high because couples make a decision, but they did not make a commitment. Each person made the decision to stand before God and take vows. They recited those, they made a decision, they kissed one another, and they walked out to live happily ever after. They didn't intend, I am sure, to end in divorce court. So why did they ultimately divorce? The answer is they made a decision, but they did not make a commitment. And that, my friends, is pretty much the same case when you join a church. You pick one, and barring some truly egregious failure to live according to the gospel, you stick with it. You make a commitment, a commitment that is vital to the entire community, a commitment that can have far-reaching implications. So we only heard a brief snippet this morning, but I would encourage you to read this week the entire book of Ruth. It's short, but to look at it and think about commitment. Here we have the story of a mother-in-law, Naomi, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And if you remember, Naomi, her husbands, and two sons pack up and move to a neighboring country of Moab because there's a famine in Israel. Their sons would grow up and marry two Moabite girls. And then tragically, all three men in that family die. And they leave three widows, Naomi, Orpah and Ruth. Naomi decides that she's going to return home to Israel and her two daughter-in-laws want to go with her. Naomi says, no, you should stay here. This is your home. Reluctantly, Orpah agrees to stay, but not Ruth. Her unforgettable words to Naomi define the essence of commitment. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And you know the story, they go back, two women, and you wonder in those days how those two women would hope to survive. And yet in the end, Ruth, guided by Naomi and the Holy Spirit and God's provision, meets and marries a rich farmer named Boaz. You guys know this story, I know you do. 
they have a baby boy that many years later will be the grandfather of the great King David. And it will be through King David's lineage that Jesus will be born. One person's decision to make a commitment changed the whole trajectory, including our own lives. Israel's greatest king owed his life to the solid commitment between Ruth and Naomi. When we think about commitment, I alluded to it earlier that it is not solely, it's not even most importantly about what you choose to commit to giving today. It is about the relationships that will come about because we have been faithful to utilize the resources that God has given us. When we think about people, we need to be thankful for one another. We are important to one another. We need to be thoughtful about people. We need to be trustworthy in our relationships. In the stewardship of our commitment to people, we need to keep our promises, honor our word, and to do what is right. Commitment is not a very popular word in religious circles these days. We allow people to break commitments and then make excuses when they don't honor them because we don't want to offend anybody. But the lack of commitment is the greatest enemy of the Christian faith. It is what causes the divorces to happen within the church the departures. We might make a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but most of us struggle to make a commitment to live our lives on a daily basis according to the way that God wants us to live. It's not easy. There's a lot of things that pull and tug at us. God's people have made a decision about Jesus. But this morning, I would ask you, have you made a commitment to follow Jesus? How many of you can honestly say that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? I suspect that we all struggle when we hear these words that the Apostle Paul writes in the letter to the Romans. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Romans 12, 1 from the message. That is commitment. As disciples, we are called to be lifelong learners, to make a commitment to continue to grow spiritually, to take positive steps in our walk, to start a Bible reading plan, to set aside each day a certain amount of time to pray, to read good Christian literature, to watch good Christian God-given programming. And in addition to our personal relationship, we are called to be committed to the life of the church. The New Testament is clear that we are together as God's people, even when it's not easy. Because the local church is a reflection of who God is. Even with its imperfections, 
we are still the avenue through which Jesus will accomplish his work if we are committed to the task. Someone once wrote, I have watched the parade of people through our church and other churches, and I wonder why so few commit themselves to the local body of Christ in any significant way. Many sit and soak and do little else, and they flee at the first sign of trouble or pressure. They fail to become involved or to give. The priority for corporate worship falls far down on the list. They criticize all that is wrong. So the question is, what can we do besides comment or complain about the current state of the church. I am convinced that some of the reason why our pews are empty is because that is exactly what people hear from us about the church. Our complaints, our comments, our expectations, and not as much about what God is actually doing through the life of our congregation. And that comes, my friends, because we have made a decision, but not a commitment. Not to one another, but to Christ himself. We have good intentions. I know we do when we join a church. We plan on it. We want to get involved. We want to engage. And yet somehow we don't all get there. We make a decision but we don't make a commitment. Some of you have heard the story about the pig and a chicken walking down the road together, and as they walk by, they read a sign advertising a breakfast to benefit the poor. The chicken says to the pig, you and I should donate a ham and egg breakfast. The pig replied, whoa, 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 not so fast. <laughs> for you, it would be just a contribution, but for me, it would be total commitment. The pig at least understood that it is not possible to offer a partial commitment, to make a partial sacrifice. To commit ourselves to God means that we are to yield ourselves to him, to surrender, to abandon ourselves, to entrust ourselves to him, and to place ourselves at Christ's own disposal. True commitment is not something that you can take back. The stewardship of commitment demands personal fidelity, integrity, and devotion. It is a responsibility to fill with the joy of a heartfelt felt decision and commitment to please the Lord in word, in deed, and with attitude of heart. To the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please stand for the affirmation of faith as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Today we come for our pastoral prayer knowing that there are some among us um, who are facing um, pain, uncertainty, failure to heal and recover as quickly as they had hoped. And so today as we pray, I want you to remember that there are people who are missing here today. 
that would normally have been here no matter what. And yet circumstances have kept them at home. And so we lift them up in prayer today. Let us pray. Holy God, the stress and strain of these days can wear heavy. As we move through fall and as the days grow shorter, we are more in need of the hope and the light that you provide. Set our eyes to the sun, the moon, and the stars and remind us of the more of this universe is plotted and patterned by your hand. Be with us in the small struggles as well as the great. Transform us so we can be transformational in love and service, for you are our refuge, our comfort, and our strength. Surround those who are suffering with your grace, with your peace. May neighbors turn to help neighbors. May we be each other's hope, our hands and feet and voice. Help us to seek reconciliation through your beloved community inspired by Christ's reconciling ministry among us. Empower us to work for what is good and equitable and just. And we ask that you would look upon us with mercy and grace. Grant us the wisdom and humility to seek your way above all worldly ways so our path may be righteous and true. Guide us, God, in all things. As a people of faith, we lift these prayers to you, trusting you hear us and receive us. And now hear us as we pray the prayer which Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we consider our commitment, um, there is a stewardship liturgy that is on the screen. It is not in your bulletin, so you'll need to look at the screen. But it is to allow us to take this moment and to really center our hearts and minds and reflect what does God want Forest Presbyterian Church to do? What difference will Forest Presbyterian Church make? But more importantly, what difference will you individually make to the life of this congregation, to the life of the community, and to the life of the global world, for we are surely connected to one another. Please join me in the litany. Creator of all, the earth is yours, the world, and all who live in it. You have entrusted us with gifts, time, talent, energy, money, and ask us to use them to build your kingdom. With thanks and praise, we respond to your call. We bring these gifts you have given to us, returning your generosity, paying it forward. We offer ourselves, our lives, our hopes and fears, our dollars and our hours. We commit ourselves to work for your world, to love and to serve wherever you call. We ask your blessing on this, your church, as we seek to follow you with heart, mind, and soul. Bless also these gifts, our investment in your future, that they may multiply in faith, hope, and love. Amen. As our ushers come forward, I would encourage you to place your commitment cards in the plates as they come through.
Almighty God, you are the God who multiplies all that is given to you. And so today we ask that you might receive these gifts, that you might multiply them for the work of your kingdom, and that we might be faithful stewards of our time, our talents, and our resources. We pray this to the glory of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. we stand as part of Christ's own body. We are called to give our body, our mind, and heart to the cause of the kingdom. That is commitment, and that kind of commitment is what our Lord demands. Commitment is a two-edged sword. When you commit yourself to God, you commit yourself to obey him, and with commitment, comes responsibility. Luke 6.40 says, But why do you call me Lord and do not do the things which I say? It raises the question then, can you follow him and not do the things he says? The question is the equivalent to a positive declaration. You cannot call me Lord if you do not do the things I say. The Apostle Paul issues a clear call for commitment. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To God be all honor, power, and glory forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May the love of God the Father Almighty and the grace of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us today and tomorrow and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May you go to be a blessing. <laughs>